Nuclear energy at a turning point, seeing momentum as power demand jumps from electrification and data centers. But the industry's traditionally steep price tag threatening U.S. goals to triple nuclear power by uh, 2050. Uh, Pippa Stevens is uh, in uh, Waynesboro, Georgia, where the first U.S. reactor built in years now is operational. Pippa. Good morning, Andrew. I'm here at Southern Company's plant Vogel beneath this massive 600-foot cooling tower. And in the background, you can see nuclear reactor 4, which recently connected to the grid. Together with reactor 3, which came online last year, they're the first newly built reactors in the U.S. in 30 years. Now, they sit beside two reactors that booted up in the late 80s, meaning this plant now provides power for more than 2 million homes making it the largest clean energy source in the U.S. Nuclear makes up roughly 20 percent of the U.S. electric grid, but new builds have stalled. The meltdowns at Chernobyl and Fukushima shifted the public discourse on nuclear power. The industry also has a history of being over budget and behind schedule. This plant is no exception. It was seven years late and more than double the estimated cost, some of which falls on Georgia's residents. Southern Environmental Law Center called the price tag astronomical, estimating that a third of next year's rate hikes are because of Vogel 3 and 4. Southern Company CEO Chris Womack told me that the cost overruns are because the U.S. hadn't built a reactor in so long and that to meet surging power demand, we need an all-of-the-above energy approach, including nuclear. We see an economy, we see a state that is growing. We see usage that is also increasing. There's not a great, a better investment uh, from an energy standpoint than nuclear power in terms of where we are today and the fact that these units are going to run some 60 to 80 years. Now that these plants are online, there are no new commercial reactors under construction in the U.S. And Andrew, I got to tell you, this really only scratches the surface. We got an inside look yesterday at this highly, very finely tuned operation. There are miles and miles of pipes beneath me, miles and miles of cable, and even enough cement, I'm told, to pave a sidewalk all the way from Seattle to Miami. It was what, 20? I mean, Pippa, how many years did this take to come to fruit? I can't even, this is such, to the fact that you're finally standing there, it, it, could right. it be 20 years? I mean, how long has this taken? It's, I, I hope like you're right, the, the next generation, we've talked about the one out in the Midwest, are, are people going to try to stick with this scope of project or to try to do something a little bit more you know, affordable and doable from now on? So this was started in 2009, and so the company notes that there were a lot of hurdles that led to, the, to it being behind schedule and the cost overruns. Of course, the financial crisis, and then we had COVID. Their uh, supplier, Westinghouse, even went bankrupt at one point. And then, but more importantly, they say it was simply because the U.S. had lost the know-how for how to build one of these. I got to tell you, it is really, really finely tuned in there. We saw the steam turbine room, and this just takes an enormous amount of manpower to get one of these off the ground. Also, the NRC, this industry is highly, highly regulated. They changed some of the regulations when this plant had already started construction, leading them to have to rethink how these would operate. But this new AP-1000, they are the first of their kind in the U.S., and they are now being built around the world, just not here. However, there is a lot of hope that other companies can take away some of the insights that Southern Company learned here and then apply those to other reactors. But in the meantime, yeah. Kelly, as you noted, there is a lot of momentum behind SMRs, those smaller modular reactors.